when we're looking back at like, oh, wow, look how inspiring it is that like Sam was in the hospital getting chemotherapy, but like working on triaging bugs, right? And it's like, that's, that that's, shouldn't be inspiring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's not yeah. like that, that's, that's a, that's a consequence of us having just a, such a huge stack of bad practices <laughs> That that he had to do that to yeah. compensate and, and for no how bad time and no it. success yet, right? So like, yeah, every, yeah. Everything like what, what you're seeing, what you're seeing in that moment is just like a man with 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 nothing to lose. <laughs> Scotch. Hey everybody, welcome to episode four hundred forty six of Coffee with Butterscotch, the game dev comedy podcast of Butterscotch Shenanigans. I'm Seth, and I'm the games programmer. I'm Adam, and I'm the Scalanius programmer. I'm Sam, and that's a lot of numbers. Yep. stunned. This is a show where we talk about life, business, and working in the games industry. Today's still December 8th, 20 Jubilee. Before we get started, we have a warning. It's going to be swears in this show. Mm-hmm. We, we have also an advertisement. Like to thank- They're going to be swears on this show. Oh, yeah. yeah. We have a promise. Uh, we'd also like to thank our recurring supporters over at moneygrab.bscotch.net. Thank you so much for your monthly donations to help keep the podcast going. Uh, now, we are recording this episode immediately after we recorded the prior episode because, well, the holidays are coming and we're going to be pretty much absent. Mm-hmm. So we're, we got to squeeze these in. Uh, so we're just going to do questions. Let's do this episode. Lots and lots of questions. Or one, depending. <laughs> Ready? Yep. Ready. All right. So these questions come from our listeners over at podcast.bscutch.net. The highest upvoted question for today comes from Tim Conceivable, Ooh. who said, I saw that the Google Play Store now has games that can be played in Chrome on PC. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on this? Would you all consider optimizing your games on mobile to be played on PC now? No, Much. I don't understand why this exists. <laughs> well, the answer is no, but here's why, which is the mobile market has been driven to into the dirt and for pricing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so for the most part, it's not possible to make money with premium titles on mobile because of how cheaply they have to be sold, right? And because the stores don't, don't show them to people. So the only reason we put stuff on mobile anyway is if, you know, we think it can move enough units that it's fine, right? Mm-hmm. But that only works because mobile, the mobile market doesn't compete with the desktop yes. market, right? So so the PC market is actually, the, the prices of things increase over time like they should, you know, like that kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. They actually match the reality of, of the cost of making games, um, at least better. Um, they still actually don't keep up, um, but certainly a lot better. And so having those markets be fully non-competing is actually essential for us to survive. Because if we start cannibalizing our PC sales yeah. with mobile sales, which literally like we, the best we could do is sell them for like a quarter of the price, right? Then that becomes a big problem. So, so that said, I think most people, given their chance, would still spend $30 on Steam before they would spend, you know, $7 on mobile and then run it in a fucking emulator on their PC or yeah, something. I would have to I have to look into what is even happening with this because like is it is it still Android? It's still Android. It's yeah. still Android. Yeah, because there's yeah. another kind of weird problem we have, which is um when we are programming the game and setting it up to to work well on mobile, uh, you know, we have to have hooks in the game that ask, hey, is this on Android? If so, do this. Mm-hmm. Because Android devices behave differently then a PC does in a bunch of really important ways. Did you know, for example, that the back button on your Android device is actually backspace from a keyboard? Mm-hmm. So when you hit that back button, it's actually sending the, the backspace command to the, the app, right? So so we've had to do stuff like – and also like some other things on the on the phone also send keyboard inputs and weird mm-hmm. stuff like that. And so we have to do stuff like on Android, we, we – fully ignore keyboard inputs because it actually like messes with the game and kind of breaks things in in weird ways. Um, Or if you're using a controller on Android, every time you press a button with the controller, it sends both a gamepad input and a keyboard input. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at no, the same real time, real good. So, but yeah. I think even beyond, so let's say, let's say we could, theory, like we could. Yeah, let's say in theory, it, we had the technical stuff figured out. Whatever. The main thing for me is just that it's just more why. Like the first point: who is using this? Yeah, that's why? my question. Who's using it? Um, and more importantly, how big What's is the people using it? 
what's our incentive to spend the dev time doing it? Yeah, because the reality is that that group of people using it is going to be very, very small. We know Google Play wants us to do this. We get emails about it. They're like, hey, do you guys want to put your stuff on Chrome OS or whatever the fuck they call it? I'm like, and no. then we're, and we're like, hey, do you want to give us money? And they're like, no. And we're like, also no then. Yeah, because, <laughs> because it's not it's not a large enough – it's not a new audience – in a, or a large enough audience that it, it makes any business sense. For but us. also who is, because the sure. audience then is going to be people who have mobile titles that they really love to play that aren't available on PC. So they want to play them mm-hmm. there, right? That's not the case for us because our titles are also on PC. Uh, and people who want games really cheap because it's just cheaper to have games on mobile, right? Uh, and I think the audience is do- actually Google executives who are pushing Chromebooks. Yeah, probably. That's actually, because yeah, you can't play, because I don't think you can have Steam on a Chromebook, can you? Or maybe you can. It's, it is a, is it a Linux sure. operating system? I actually don't know what it is. Okay, it's I don't gotta, know. Actually, yeah, I don't know what it it's is. It's got to be a Linux thing. But or is to me, it that's, just like that's Android? I don't, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so no. We've gotten to this point where like most of the time it was when someone is like, hey, we got this, 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 new, thing. this new thing. Where I have so many questions now and the answers are always, almost always, almost always guaranteed to be not satisfactory. What do you have? It's usually, about trust it? us, we're X large company, right? It's usually. Yes. And Which, spoiler um, alert, it never pans doesn't out. doesn't pan out very often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even when you are X large company. Yep. So then we say, we'll trust you if you pay us money. And they're like, well, we're not going to pay you money. And then we're like, then that means that you don't trust that we could make that money. Back put for your you. money where your mouth is. If you're a and trillion like, dollar company, never mind. Put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. Quit yeah, making. Never, quit putting the risk on us. We're we got eight people over here. You leave us alone, okay? Yeah, you got thirty nine billion dollars. You can <laughs> and, you can swing something. Yeah. And they already are trying to take thirty percent of the money that we do make with our exactly. Here, you know, yeah, yeah. You stay, take some of that money. Go do give something. It, with give it them. back. Yeah. To us. <laughs> yeah, give it. Just give it back to us. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty skeptical. We're pretty dubious. I'm of not just most- skeptical. I'm fucking over it. Is what I am. Any large company that comes to us and is like, "Hey, we'd love to have your stuff on here. Uh, you know, we'll give you a good cut." I'm like, "A good cut of what? You got nothing." So, yeah. <laughs> but you have a fuck load of money. So just give us the money. And they're like, I don't know about that. That seems crazy. And I'm like, exactly. Yeah, it sure does. It does seem yeah, crazy have, to do a, a bunch of work for no reason. You're right. So I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Bye. I'll We're never done. forget. I don't know if we've talked about this poke a long time ago. I, maybe I, I don't know if I could say which company it was, right, yeah. but yeah. there was, there was a company that was, that was releasing a new kind of like a, like a TV console. We're talking thing. 2015. It was before crash. Something, things, right. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they come to us and they're like, hey, uh, do you want to put Quadrupus Rampage on our device? And we were like, uh, well, maybe, you know. Can and you also, just- this was at a, this was at a time where we were still like, we had zero, just zero dollars in the bank, right? And so, like, uh, anything we did that could get us some money was all was almost almost good, no matter what, almost good, right? Yeah, uh, we were with the time of- rich and money poor. Actually, yeah, we're time poor, money poor, to be full. We, we didn't have much time or money, yeah. and, <laughs> and there were other is- issues that we were dealing with at the time yep. as well. <laughs> yep. um, so, so then this company comes to us and like, hey, Quadrupus Rampage, it seems like it'd be a great fit for our new device. We got like a marketplace, we got all this stuff, and we were like, great, go ahead and like send us a dev kit, um, and we will see if the game is compatible with the oh, device. I know what you're talking about. If we can run, if it can run yeah. on there. Yeah. And they were like, oh, you can buy a dev kit from us. And we were like, how much? And they're like, a hundred dollars. We're like, so you're you're saying to us that on balance, your <laughs> best business move is to get our hundred dollars this way because you're probably not going to get any more money than that yeah. from the game and itself. This is, this, by the way, this is a very fucking large company. So this is not like a one startup. of the largest, in fact, among the largest of companies yeah. doing this. And yeah, we were like so. If you give us a dev kit, we'll see if we can get it built for it. And, and they, they were like, give not. us money. We'll give you a dev kit. Like, well, this is, this is not how this works at all. <laughs> yeah. It works if you're, if you're PlayStation with a monopoly on a huge existing market, right? Mm-hmm. Then, mm-hmm. yeah, you can sell your dev kits for whatever they sell these days, like $15. Switch, 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 switch. Switch. Yeah. Yeah. Or switch, if you're trying to just yeah, convince consoles, people right? to just come onto your platform to begin with, yeah. you've got to put your money where your mouth is, yeah. you know? And ideally, like literally, you know, I'd love to see somebody from one of these companies literally just shove a fistful of money into their mouth. Just kind of, <laughs> it'd be, it'd be an interesting it thing there. to witness. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. So probably, so, you know, if, if by some miracle of all, if all the gods of the universe come together, because this is how much power it would take to make this miracle happen. If they all come together and somehow make Chrome on PC a viable gaming platform. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or make, make Google be or pay us to give do you, it. or yeah, like, or I don't know, which again would also take a miracle. Or something. Yeah, because, <laughs> because you're going to have to support this forever. This is not a yeah. free thing forever. It's not a one time thing, and they always act like it is. It's like, yeah. oh, it's so easy. You just games do have to be maintained. No, yeah. Then I got yeah. like twelve people review bombing it, which apparently is probably going to share with the Play Store because the fucking keybind inputs don't work anymore because of some update you guys did. Now I got to go deal with that. And yeah, it's, t- it's like. No, it's actually similar to it's similar to the Mac problem that we have with games, which is like yeah. almost nobody on Steam uses a Mac. But Mac is gonna if you if you launch your game on Mac, mm-hmm. then it's gonna be the source of ninety five percent of your bug reports because engine developers like Unity or Game Maker or Unreal or whatever also they also know invested. they also know that like nobody uses Mac to play games, and so mm-hmm. they don't put much time into ensuring that the engine works super well on Mac. Yeah, same right? with so same with Linux, right? Same deal. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just a circular problem. Like as soon as you as soon as you jump into that vortex, you just get sucked right down into it. You know? Mm-hmm. So just don't just don't even just dip don't. your toe in. Nope. No <laughs> thanks. Uh all right, next question comes from Lexap, who says, We all know oh. that Crashlands 2 will be a masterpiece of a single player experience. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> We all know this, yep. uh, but if you, <laughs> if you did this all, we all know, everybody, everybody, everybody knows. Uh, but if you did decide to do multiplayer, such as online co-op or not, even a, a grand GAAS live game. What does that mean? Games Ga- as a service. Games as a service. Game as a service. Okay. I've never seen that abbreviated before. I don't know what. Uh, uh, I've, I've, even a grand, I see platform as a service a lot in the tech. Like web tech space, you know. So every time I see Pass. lowercase a, lowercase a, capital S at the end of a thing, I'm like, okay, this is some kind of an as a service. Just got to figure out the fucking first one is, you know. You got pass gas, okay? It's a platform as a service gas. that is a game service. Right. You get pass so, gas. so they're asking uh, if we did do multiplayer, such as online co op or even a big game as a service live game, a la Minecraft slash Roblox, would you DLC this game or start fresh? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, uh, so, this, this is, so this is saying not Crashlands Two itself, but the it's next. Saying, thing. Hypothetically, if you built a multiplayer game next, what? How would it would, you be, like, it would be a new title. Yeah, but would you like riff off the tech essentially? Like a, how how close are a human? So I'm actually I used to be exclusively interested in getting to the point of making multiplayer games because like for me, kind of my formative gaming experience was, was wow. Where like mm-hmm. I enjoyed games and I had some really great gaming experiences with things like final fantasy 10 and stuff like that. But the, but the first game that actually like really hooked me in, in a, in a big way was wow. And a lot of that came from the world of Warcraft. A lot of that came from the, like uh, that weird feeling of like walking into a town and then just like, seeing other people just like there. Oh, just there's cool shit. Walking. Yeah. It was amazing. It was like the craziest shit I'd ever seen, you know? Um, and it was, and it inspired me. I was like, I want to, I want to make this. Like I want to make something like this someday. Um, but now being on the other side of it, on the development side and kind of recognizing if you make a multiplayer game, it can die. Yeah. You, you have to keep it alive. You cannot stop working on it. Period. Like it, it'll die. Like if 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 Riot Games came out today and they announced, "Hey guys, we're not going to be doing any more League of Legends patches. No more patches. No more new champions. No. Yep. Just uh, it's the just game. Is, the game is the same as it is. Which yep. like people are playing it right now and having a great time yeah, because right? of what it is. Right. Yeah. Because of what it is. But as soon as the promise of future development goes away people are like oh well i guess they i guess it's slowly, over then. yeah because yeah. it's, it's a hedonic treadmill right if you're trying to get people to play a game constantly for the rest of time they're gonna need changes you, so gotta, keep keep it you gotta keep it fresh yeah. baby you know you gotta just shake things up you know and so and it's, it's different from make like let's say you're talking about something like discord right which is a service it's not a game yeah. as a service it just is a service it does a thing in a utilitarian way, and, it, and you use it no to point solve where, an ongoing problem you always have, which is right. You always have a problem, and and there's no point where you're like, God, you know, I'm just bored of of Discord. I'm just going to stop using it. It's boring now, right? Mm-hmm. It's like no, like you're using it to do something, which is like voice chat and mm-hmm. keep in touch with communities. Whatever. It's not, it's not an entertainment product that's that has like a narrative or you know whatever else, right? Uh, and so when it comes to a game as a service, it it works differently. 
and it has a much higher maintenance cost than actual services do. Yes, it has to keep cost. being, it has to keep bringing novelty and entertainment in, and also in a way that you can make money off of, because you have to find ways to monetize right. the new content that you have, right? Um, which, we, like, and personally, and you can't I do have, other stuff because that's where all your time and money is going. Yeah. yeah, like I've I've gone I've gone from having like being interested in that to being not interested in it to being actively hostile to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> because okay. like I don't I don't want to be spending my days trying to think about how to design our games from a monetization perspective. Like how do we inject stuff into this game to Which squeeze you, you money just out of have people, to you know? for a game as a service because they're you have to it's, it's expensive as fuck to well, you have to you it's it's one thing to do like maintenance on a game post launch. Or like you know, small DLCs or whatever. It's a whole other thing to do the the games as a service model, right? In terms of just yeah. yeah, the degree to which your your whole operation has to be scaled and function around that kind of constant content output. Um, yeah, you need to kind of spin it off as a separate business, basically. Yeah. I think that's the business. I think that? I, yeah, I wouldn't want to do a games as a service model. I do think, um, but also there's multiplayer that where a game is a, is multiplayer. Versus a game has multiplayer. Yes, exactly. Right. So I like the something that has multiplayer, but isn't where it isn't a required fact of it. Does that make sense? Is where the space that I like to operate in, both personally and like when I play games, and also in terms of making them, I do still want to be able to play with people, um, and I would definitely like to be able to do that at some point. I think you know probably the reality is like we've gotten such a good model now with the Game Changer, and and you know, making Crashlands too has really transformed the studio from the bottom up, like how we do everything um, and structurally, such that I think we actually we could do it. You know, um, yeah, we've solved a lot of the really hard problems that were kind of in our minds prerequisites to tackling the multiplayer problem. Yeah, you so know? if it could, so, you know, for the next one to kind of leverage the same tech. Yeah, I think we would because I mean, like doing a multiplayer thing is is that big. You know, we always talk about you choose your next project based on how you would like to grow, right? And so, questions two was saying, how can we make authored content at scale? That was the question. Can we figure out how to do this? Um, and we have now, which is great. And that happens to have allowed us to do a bunch of other things too, which in many ways sets us up to potentially, if we want to, for the next project, say, how do you network in the multiplayer space? How do we make something in the multiplayer space that, yeah, doesn't have to have constant updates? It's not a game as a service, but it has multiplayer in it. You know, almost like a Terraria sort of thing where it's like, or Diablo. I always play Diablo by myself or occasionally with like Adam or Seth or Jen, right? But mostly by myself. But I also love playing games like that multiplayer. So it's one of those things where that's the kind of experience that I would probably create, which is something where you could, it's totally soloable, totally enjoyable, very fun. And then it's just more fun with with other people. And that's, and that. that's where you get like the, all you get, there's still always the costs of multiplayer because it's a very complicated thing you have to do, right? But when it's a, when it's a, single player game with multiplayer then you don't have the same sort of problems because because Seth was talking about how the games die if they're mul if they're a multiplayer game so because they just require everybody to be enough people to be interested that there are enough people for you to play with because the people are the content right yeah. uh, and so that's what kills them but that's also what gives you either a positive or a negative feedback loop at the beginning yes right yeah. um so so multiplayer games and games that are designed for specifically around multiplayer are extremely risky because not only are they really hard to make because you have all these extra layers of technological problems you have to deal with, they're really hard to scale and they're really expensive to maintain because you have to manage servers and do this other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of upfront costs that you have to take on that just make them way more expensive in the first place. So your risk is already way higher. And then you're basically putting yourself though into, you're getting the risk reward pool, right? Like if it pays yeah, off- then the population of people, yeah, this is what you see like with Among Us, right? And it's these, these yeah. kinds of like runaway hits, right? Our runaway Which hits, oftentimes, they, oftentimes they languish for a while. Yeah, because yeah. they need to We're hit like, a critical mass. And most of them languish for a while and then stay languishing forever, right? But every once in a while, you, get these, you, have, like, you, you either have ones that launch and don't really do much and then just slowly die. Or you have, to me, the saddest ones, which is ones that have enough hype or enough interest in them at the front that you do have that big launch spike. But then it, then they just die, sort of. Yeah, it just goes away after that, which is even worse, you know, because it's like oh, you get, there's something there, but it's not quite mixed up in such a way that it'll sustain itself. And actually, that doesn't really bother me that much because I kind of think of that as like a, a cultural phenomenon, right? Like everybody yeah, kind of participate, right. like you created a cultural phenomenon that everybody participated on. And once it's true for single player games 
too, that you make most of yeah, your income in the first like couple of months. Like it's the same curve actually, right? So I actually like that part doesn't really hmm. bother me. I think that's that's okay. I think it's mostly just that since you have to have that critical mass, again, it's it's, it's like a steam algorithm or anything else. We're always dealing with with algorithmic feedback loops and and your ability to get a game sold to people. The more people who talk about it and want to see it and want to play it, the more people who do, and it, and it can really blow up, right? But also, the fewer people who do, it goes mm-hmm. down the other way, right? And, and all of the algorithms that you're, that you're facing when you're trying to sell a game in the store, search engine results, and, and YouTubers being interested and all these kinds mm-hmm. of things, right? All of them are both positive and negative feedback loops. And so multiplayer games are the ones that like the degree to which they can blow up. Positive, yeah. Yeah, because it can require it, but also if it does manage to do it, it can fucking bl- it can really blow up when it's. Yeah, I mean, you look at like it. Lethal Company, for example, which just came out recently. Yeah, four players, right? It is. It's it's not going to be a fun game to play by yourself. Doesn't make sense. Like the the value proposition is easy in playing with people. Yeah, but it's a cultural right. phenomenon that they've created. Yeah, amazing, right? And you see the like the sales are ridiculous. It's like a hundred thousand reviews already, right? Came out yeah, last. It's month. it's outselling everything right now, right? And it will yeah. for a little while. And yeah. but there's tons of those games also that I've watched in the last month that have not done anything. Yeah, just yeah. nothing. And you can't. Or, or they'll do this like kind of middling thing where sort of like because um, like especially adversarial multiplayer games is like player versus player stuff. Mm-hmm. They have a longevity problem yeah, where as as people get better at the game, and new the, players have a worse time. Yeah, and as people learn how to hack the game, everybody has a worse right. time. There's always yeah. right. Yeah. So you have yeah, so you have that, and so you have this thing where like. It's like I, I was just I was just looking up. Uh, remember the game Shotgun Farmers? Yeah, yeah, yeah I love that. So, yeah, so that's from 2017. And like, if you look at it on Steam, it has like nine nine thousand reviews on Steam. And you're like, yeah, you're like damn, like that's a that game is doing very yeah, well. That's great for an indie. Which game, would yeah. be true if it was a single player game, because mm-hmm. the actual metric that matters for a multiplayer game is concurrent players, because yeah. that's what dictates your ability to do matchmaking. Right. So, for example, if a new player comes in, they don't get dumped into the only lobby that exists that has people who have been that playing three the game since 2017. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so you know, so Shotgun Farmers right now has 14 concurrent players, mm-hmm. which you know, for an indie game that came out uh, six or seven years ago, it's not you know, bad. And, and like, yeah. it's not bad. And like with the number of sales that it got, stuff like that, but. As a multiplayer game, that does mean that you start matchmaking problems. Basically, you're gonna have problems, right? We saw this with yeah, even so a the, bigger title like Tribes. So. Yeah, they they just they pulled straight up pulled the plug on it. Like you can't yeah. even play Tribes Ascend anymore. The, they shut the servers down, and there's like community members who are trying to resurrect it. But again, I, like I who, did who, see, I don't know if it was a leak or what it was, or like a really weird early preview or something. But supposedly there is another Tribes under development by somebody. Yeah, there, there's a there's an indie company who's been who made a game called Midair, which was a, a tribes, tribes inspired kind yeah. of game. Um, but this is an actual that, Tribes game that didn't do that well, and then they're making a sequel, which also I think isn't doing very well. But uh, yeah, so I think Tribes probably, is a niche title. Actually, is is the yeah, truth? It is. You know? Um, yeah, yeah, for whatever. But reason. it's also, I feel like it. I think Tribes was ahead of its time. I feel like it's a game that actually would do very well in the like Twitch world of today. Yeah, in terms of like how crazy the gameplay More is and stuff. Sort of vibes in terms of just like yeah. high level play looking just absurd. Yeah, but when Tribes Ascent came out, it was 2012, and mm-hmm. streaming was very. It was getting going, but it was barely getting started. Kind of at that point, um, and like it didn't have that that much impact. So. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's like, so I think personally I'd be interested in like what these guys are talking about. I'd be okay with making a game that, that multiplayer is an, is an additional layer onto the game. Mm -hmm. But I also kind of feel, I have mixed feelings about that because every time I've played a game that, that has multiplayer, but isn't a multiplayer game, the multiplayer experience, it's, I mean, it's very much like playing a D and D session in the sense that your experience is now 100% dictated by the people you're playing with and what they know or don't know about the game and how they like to play versus like how that stacks up against and then how, how you like to play. And then how you design like how the multiplayer, because because the fact is yeah. like there's no single player design that multiplayer can be tacked onto and have that be fine, right? It has to influence the Something's got to give. Yeah, it has, yeah. To, it has to change in some way and and – uh, I think, yeah, it's a pretty rare game that you can play. I don't know. I can't even think of one that if you play it as a single player versus a multiplayer, you have basically the same experience, except it's just more fun because you have more people. Right. I think, mm-hmm. I think Terraria is like the one I can think of. I would like say Mario, my, um, Mario Odyssey, where one person yeah. plays as the hat. Right. Which is like, but I, I yeah, I played that. I 
uh, it just sounds like bored out, out of my mind. Yeah, but I mean, that's fair. I, but I yeah. get how that can be a thing, though. That like could be super fun, right? But it says that like like you're you're actually playing as one character, right? And you're just kind of like still go, you're still seeing all the same stuff and going through the same game content and all that. But you're you're playing it as like one of you is the hat of the other character, and so yep. you're doing it together, right? And so this is kind of the problem we had like when we when we played Baldur's Gate three multiplayer is that the story and the narrative and all the really cool stuff about the game just goes right out the window. Yeah, because yeah. it takes time to participate yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. And like time, other like people are impatient, you know. So. You know, you're, it's essentially offering like just a different experience, like a, just a different lens on that whole well, game. Yeah, but, it, but that's the point, though, is that you can't, there's not such a thing as like a game design where you, the intent of the design is fully supported both in single player yes. and multiplayer, yeah. right? Uh, it, it's not to say you can't create a good experience in both, right? But it's that to be able to do so is an enormous fucking challenge to pull off. Uh, now, even even outside of the, of the of the tech problems, like just from a design standpoint, it, that's I think about like I think really, about like really Halo or like shooters, right? Where you do have again, I, it's almost I think to me it's like a there's a required almost like a I'm gonna call it simplicity, right? but yeah. a simplicity in the mechanical set or the narrative set, or whatever else that is required in order to essentially more easily leverage a multiplayer mode or addition, right? Um, and even in the case of like Terraria, it's a sandbox, so it wouldn't matter. Yeah, you can just drop in and out. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you go left or right. In the same way, that it doesn't matter if there's two people who are going left or right or whatever. You know, it's like, it's all yeah. kind of the same in the same way that Halo needs in the case of, you know, single player for these shooters, like you need, you essentially need single player content, right? But then but, but that's interesting, right? Because there's, because like a lot of these games, there's a single player content, right? Yeah. There's always a single player. That you don't play campaign. multiplayer. Yeah, the yeah. campaign is like a single player experience. Or you might play co-op. They separate it out. Right? Yeah. You might play co-op, but you don't yeah. play in a competitive, or you don't repeatedly play, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, so. There's, there's another kind of interesting angle that Blizzard is doing in WoW, and the, they have an upcoming patch They'll probably be out with uh, maybe within like six weeks or something like that, where instead of this idea of like having a single player focused game that has multiplayer, they're actually kind of doing it the opposite direction, which is of course, wow, is an MMO. Yeah. Um, so everything about it is meant to be played as a group pretty much. Um, but the open world stuff is, is pretty easy. And so people view open world stuff like questing and exploring or whatever. That's like the single player content, but it's not mm -hmm. challenging. You just kind of go, do go out and do stuff, right? And then the group content is the really hard, challenging content that scales up really high. So the problem is there's a lot of people who have done a lot of the open world stuff, but they're very intimidated about the social dynamics of getting into group content because they, if they've never done it before, they don't want to be the person in the group who has no idea what's going on and potentially wipes the group or causes problems and gets yelled at or whatever, right? Which, you know, doesn't really happen that often, but if it does happen to you, it really feels like shit, yep. right? And so what they're doing is they're they're taking some of these these uh, multi like group content like a five man dungeon and they are making single player versions of those Interesting. where where bots will come in and fill out your group uh, hmm. to fill out whatever role you're not playing right mm -hmm. so like if you are a tank then they'll they'll spawn these AI characters that have like, so you get three damage yes, dealers yeah, and your yeah. healer and they'll just go at your pace. So, you know, you, like as you're going through the dungeon, you can like stop and like try to figure out what's going on or figure out the layout or like watch the cut scenes that happen or, you know, whatever. So you can kind of experience the dungeon and see the place yourself before then going into the right. the same content with a group, right? Um, so that's kind of like an interesting way yeah, to I mean, flip there's, there's it a lot of like There's a lot of interesting ways to, to do this where I think and to me in most cases, like doing a more of a essentially a co-op focused PVE thing is just a, a better bet. You know, if we were going to do something like this, it would be a much smaller project in scope because again, the, the risk is a bit higher, but also we don't know what we're doing. So it's like yeah. you do a much smaller project. You do like a, to me, a co-op PVE thing where. And we if wouldn't try have to have like a long form story and all the stuff that's really yeah, hard to exactly. figure out how to manage. But it'd be like, you know, I think of a, like risk of rain, for example, or risk rain too. I feel like it's a really good example of, of like a more a more buttoned down multiplayer experience that's really fun solo and then is just the same game but also fun multiplayer where now you have a friend with you. 
but a lot of it's because of the the particular nature of that game. It's not there's not like a lot of that long form stuff happening. Yeah. So which is not like we it is, are, it is so hard to thread that needle though, you know, because like it's Terraria, really the first time I played Terraria, I was fucking bored out of my mind because I was playing by myself, right? Uh the next time I played was with my either my wife or Sam with you. I can't remember which came first, but either way, like, like I think you played with, with Jenny first because yeah, I think I played with my wife first. I tried to play it after you guys played it. Yeah, you were also myself. bored. Yeah. I was bored as fuck. And then I played with you guys like six months later. And then, and then like, oh, it was like, great. it's now one of my favorite games of all time. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and, and every once in a while I play a little bit. I usually get bored pretty fast when I go replay it, but I still like to go replay it, you know, for mm-hmm. every once in a while, uh, but only with somebody. Right. Cause like that's what, yeah. so it is like the same, you know, experience in both cases. And I think in the same mm-hmm. way that like risk of rain or yep. like back for blood, you could technically play by yourself. Right. That's true, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, yeah, characters there. So yeah, but it's, but it's just way because of what the game is, like just like the core design of the game, it's just way more fun if there's somebody else there to the point where like that that discrepancy is enormous, right? And I think to me, that's why this is so hard is that creating an experience that is comp- that is sufficiently compelling in both variations, like the multiplayer experience, the single player experience, um, is just an enormous design challenge. And I think uh, to me, this is kind of like coming at the whole question from like just the wrong direction. Rather than saying like, will we make a multiplayer game? The real question is, is there a game does is there a game experience we want to provide for people that requires multiplayer for it to work, right? Um, yeah. And and then we work out the details of like, okay, how do we make that happen? How do you right? make it? Yep. Yeah, but but making a multiplayer game for the sake of doing it, I would just say, across the board, not a wise move because of all the reasons that we talked about. You know, I think what's weird though is like where we've gotten to in terms of both the studio skill set, our own interest and expertise, is such that essentially I would have to do the noodling on like what a multiplayer game would look like that we would eat. I basically would have to solve the design problem first to be able to then be excited to build the game, if that makes sense. I, yeah, I, it's like it, delivering it's exactly, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, yeah, we're, we're basically starting with the solution. We're like multiplayer. And then we're like, okay, let's find a problem that fits, right? And right. find an experience just, that fits, right? Yeah, yeah experience. And if it yeah. just feels like the wrong direction rather than like as we're working on a title that we are pumped about, right? Is like, oh, are there aspects of this that like we could make it possible to to bring into a multiplayer experience mm-hmm. because yeah, that, that has obvious benefits if you can pull it off. From I mean, the I, I really like the, like the, the kind of weird multiplayer experience, which I'd never had before, but in, like an Elden ring where you are playing solo. And I think you can actually, you can like link up with people to play like as, you know, together, but otherwise you can summon people just like, randos essentially to go like fight bosses together and stuff which was awesome because it was like it took the open world concept and like the whole managing difficulty yourself by you know figuring out how to scale up or kind of outscale bosses that you're having trouble with and then added this other essentially an accessibility layer to it Mm -hmm. right where you're like i'm having a hard time let me call up jerry who i know like already knows how to beat the shit out of this boss and just like Summon they, them real quick. Do they scale the bosses when you bring in a second player? No, no, no. Yes, yeah, so I, I love. Fuck, I, mean, I, lo- so, I love yeah. that idea where it's like it's both a community thing where you can like have fun with somebody, and also like you said, an accessibility thing where yeah, you can help get over a difficult thing. And, and that's I think it's a really good example of where like multi- it wasn't that doesn't feel like they're like we need multiplayer, right? That feels like it doesn't feel Wouldn't like they were like cool? trying to make yeah. multiplayer go in there, but yeah, it feels like somebody was at some point was like, you know, it'd be cool, right? And they mm-hmm. and they figured it out. Uh, the problem and, is like in order to do that, the game has to be hard as fuck to start with. You know, what well, I mean? yeah, like well, exactly. Of, it's like it's it's they already had a hard like it feels like they had a hard game and then realized they could use multiplayer as a way to solve yeah. that while also adding the social layer that would make it more interesting. Yeah. And to me, that's the direction that, that things should go. It's like you've got you've already got a th- experience you're trying to create, and you that may or may not from the gate include some kind of a social experience. I got you. Yeah, yeah. And and as you go though, you might also identify that because like ideally, mo- like a I'm just going to call it networked play uh, rather than like multiplayer, right? Strictly, but like that, that communicating over a network with other people, with other, with other versions of the other copies of the game, right? That if that's in your toolkit, then that gives you a whole new solution space to play with as you're trying to solve design challenges and, and trying Mm -hmm. to create an experience that you want your players to have. Yeah. Yeah. But just kind of, yeah, using it as a starting point is maybe a little weird. That's true. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Point. Multiplayer isn't inherently interesting. It's it's nothing. It right. is inherently risky, though. It's inherently it's, risky. So really you got to have a good reason. Uh, all right. Well, it's probably our last question of the episode. It's coming from is that three? This is we're on we're on the third now. Oh. We're coming up to the third. That'd yeah. Be great. It's from Hookah Itty Guy, who says for some reason. My Apple podcasts decided that I wanted to restart listening to the first podcasts in your show. Mm. I found myself listening to episode 15. 
from mid 2015. So Ooh, probably, 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 probably June ish. I, I love these ones because I haven't listened to any of that stuff. Uh, so it's always fun. People are like, what do you think about this bullshit you said yeah. seven years ago? Yeah. Yeah. It's probably uh, bullshit. She said, Sam was going into chemo. Oh, Trump yeah. was gaining in popularity long before the election, and Rocket League had just been released. A huge amount has changed since then, but you guys still sound the same. <laughs> what do you think the biggest change to the butterscotch business is in the last eight years? And what uh, is the biggest thing that has stayed the same? We still, mm. I guess they mean so, so sound the same. I assume just means like literal physical voices. Oh, the, the way that our voices sound. Yeah, yeah. that's right. People's voices. Good. We don't, feel like don't, we don't really, much. well, they do if you smoke, but we that's don't smoke. Because, you know, I don't, I don't fuck with my lungs. No, no, no. no Air no. only, please. Air yeah. only, please. Okay, so the question is basically like a since then, like what the biggest changes. Yeah. Well, okay. So well, yeah, what's in the in the in the company in the studio? Mm-hmm. Interpret it however you like. In I the think past eight years now. What's the what's one the one thing that you feel like has changed the, the most? And what's thing. one thing that has that has definitely stayed the same? Um, I got, yeah, I think I got one. I think it's. I think I know for me personally. I think the the motivation for making stuff has changed. Where because I remember this. We were actually talking about this morning a little bit. Back in 2015, it was like, we're going to, you know, if we get this thing to work, we're going to like scale, become a blizzard, you know. We had long-term just, fantasies of be, being a AAA, like scale. Giant company. Studio. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And I have just no interest in that at all. I have and a I think it's a terrible idea. Yeah. And so I It was know- a fantasy based on romantic ideas of- what that would look like and what it would be like. It, yeah. I don't think it would I don't think it'd be very good. No. And I think, you know, again, from like a motivation standpoint, probably since then, it's like, honestly, we were just trying to fucking survive <laughs> in so many ways. And so, you know, I didn't really enjoy doing art at the time. I did it because we needed it. But somebody had, to. Test. somebody had to do it. I was like pretty grumpy about it most of the time, <laughs> you know, and it's, which is crazy, but also like that's where I was. And so I think, I think I'm just more, I'm more into, again, this idea of providing an experience for players, providing a uh, a lifestyle <laughs> for ourselves in terms of how we do dev, and then in just doing work very well and having yeah. a good time, which was not at all remotely the, fo- it's, we said it was the focus sometimes, but it was not actually on day to day. And we thought like we, we, we thought we were being honest with ourselves about it, you know? Yes. A hundred percent. Yeah. We just. We're wrong. Yeah. So that's yeah, I think that's mine. Yeah. And I think, I think back then too, we, we had a, we had a, a strength that we, that was, I think our, our only real strength that we no longer have. Youth and ignorance. Is that what the, <laughs> yes. well, I would, I would, I would go so far as to say just straight arrogance, just <laughs> like, yeah. like the stuff that we confidently just waded into. Uh, and we had the, the time and the energy to just sort of brute force our way through those problems with very little information. Mm-hmm. In most cases, we we paid for that approach ten like times later, over yeah. afterwards. <laughs> yeah. um, and and now you know now we we've seen the consequences of it. But also we have way more tools. We have may, way more resources. We have more people. We have the ability to solve problems surgically or with tooling or with automations without using brute force or without adding more problems to the, mm-hmm. the mix, you know? Um, and so that to me is kind of the biggest thing mm-hmm. that has changed where like just the idea that it's like, we just did the crash and two play test. And, but by and large, the, the feedback we got from people, like we had, we had a few kind of a, a couple of major consistent complaints that were pretty easily addressed actually. Mm-hmm. And then otherwise it was, it was a big pile of kind of nitpicks mm-hmm. and then just a couple of bugs. Um, when I say nitpicks, I just mean, you know, quality of life features. It would be just, better if blah. It would be nice if X, you know, but it's not like I hated X and therefore I quit playing. It's just, it would be nice if this was like this, right? Um, that's, it's such a far cry from what it was like doing the beta test of the original <laughs> Crashlands, <laughs> which crazy. was like, was like four weeks before we launched it. Yeah, it was in December. Where we had over 2,000 bug reports, most of which were hugely problematic mm-hmm. bugs. Um that we had no idea we're even in there, and uh, and it was just it was just weeks and weeks of, of trying to fix the most important bugs leading up to the launch, and then six more weeks of of crunch after that to try to fix the remaining bugs. You know, I like, even I adding controller support to Crashlands took three months. Yeah, on its own. 
I remember my, the beta test too, because I went in to do, I think I had another checkup. I had my final checkup. And so they were doing all these scans and stuff. And I had, I brought my laptop because we're in the middle of this test. And I was the one scanning through the bugs and triaging for the team. And so I was, I, there was like, I think there's like a video from the Crash and documentary of like me on a hospital bed with the laptop. And I'm actually doing the beta shit. I'm getting my scans done. Also, to see if I have cancer. Yeah, right? and the thing is, and it, this, this <laughs> reminds me Christ. so much of like it was you guys a ever wild see that? Time. You guys time. ever see that fucking that subreddit called Uplifting News? Mm-hmm. I hate that. Yeah, subreddit. you mean the one that's just a horror show? Yeah, it's like local local kid sells lemonade all summer to help clear his classmates' lunch debt. Right? Yeah. And it's oh like, yeah, where you're like, why? if you look a second deeper, you're like, that's not. A thing that should even yeah. be possible. It's like, here's yeah, what wholesome yeah. stories look like under capitalism, you know? <laughs> yes. So, when, so when, we're, when we're looking back at like, oh, wow, look how inspiring it is that like Sam was in the hospital getting mm. chemotherapy, but like working on triaging bugs, right? And it's like, that's... That that's, shouldn't be inspiring. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's not yeah good. like that. That's that's a that's a consequence of us having just a such a huge stack of bad practices <laughs> that that he had to do that to yeah. compensate and, and for no how bad time and no was. success yet. Right. So like yeah, every, yeah everything like what, what you're seeing, what you're seeing in that moment is just like a man with 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 nothing to lose <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at oh, the yeah. end of his rope. And he's got no choice but to mm-hmm. just forge ahead and just do what has to be done, you know? And like, since then, we, we've tried to land in a, in a space where we have choices. We can take time with things. We try to do things better, like Adam slack talked about. Yeah. yeah, like move, move, move the solutions further upstream in the dev process, like produce fewer bugs and then like have QA, catch mm-hmm. the bugs before they get to the players, you know, all these things. Um, we didn't have that back then. <laughs> God, yeah, no. And, uh, I don't know if we even thought that we needed it. Honestly. You didn't know. You didn't know. I, you just, that's the thing. It's like, it's hard. You can't explain it to someone who's just, you're not, you're not it's like, ready. It's like when somebody has a bad partner, right? Where it's like, everybody mm-hmm. else can see it. Everybody knows, but you can't successfully tell that person that because they will not accept it. They will, they or will they not accept the facts. It. They can't see it. It's a, it's yeah. impossible, you know? It, yeah. It's the same, it idea, it's the same I think it's not even like, um, a willful ignorance sort of a thing. It's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you can't, you're not, well, it's, you can't, whole, it's no. the whole joke about the fish thing, right? Which I, I feel like they tell like every graduation, like the fish, old fish swims by a young fish. And he's like, Oh, how's the water today? The fish is like, young fish is like, what water? What's, it's yeah, like, what's water? What are you talking about? And it's like, you can't, you can't, even I don't know. See yeah. It. I think it's like, I know we had some conversations with some very smart people back then who told us things that in retrospect, gave us like, really bad advice. Or gave us really good advice. Good advice in yeah. retrospect, in retrospect, I could not understand what they were saying. I thought I did, right? But I did not. Yeah. Did but the not. problem is, though, is that it, it was mixed up with really bad advice that we also That's got. True. And yes. at that point, we can't you, we can't tell the difference. We don't know which mm-hmm. one is good, which one is bad, right? Just so dumb. Well, well, so I, just I've actually kind of like, as a consequence <laughs> of all the stuff we've been through, I feel like I've personally kind of changed how I look at helping people or giving advice. Same. Which is I, I try not to be prescriptive. I try to just be descriptive because yeah. people won't do anything that you say that they should do. But ever. also you can't be prescriptive because – our experience cannot be this even close to anybody else's experience trying to do this. Stuff. Oh, but I'm just saying, like, let's say, let's say somebody's about to do something. Like, here's here's my plan. I'm gonna do. Oh, you mean I'm even gonna, if you can obviously see, like, yeah, if no, I no, see, no. and I'm like, and I'm like, I'm like, th- this is they should probably be thinking about doing this differently or whatever. Mm-hmm. But you cannot, you l- cannot tell somebody that because they will not do it ev- ever. <laughs> it's called change so, management. It's not an effective strategy. So you know, what yeah. you do instead is is you just ask some follow-up questions that are more about scenario planning, right? Which is like, if they say, here's what I'm going to do. And you say, um, do, you ha- do you have a backup plan for what happens if once you do that, this consequence occurs, which it might, right? But without saying like, don't do that, do this other thing instead. Mm-hmm. It's just like, let me try to just add a little bit of a nugget of kind of knowledge about what's mm-hmm. probably coming your way. And ask you some questions. Ask questions. you some questions about it. Yeah. Ultimately, you're still going to do whatever you want because that was always going to be the case. Yeah. But at the very but least, hopefully maybe I can with some more information. It's actually yeah. called – it's a technique called motivational interviewing. It's also one of the only ways to get people to get vaccinated who are super against it. You get literally like, – oh, really? It's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. They literally have like doctors now getting trained in this in places to be like, how, here's how you actually talk to someone to – more or less it's about you know convince them to do something 
in their interests even. But like, you can't just be like, it's in your interest. Do it. You're so dumb. It's like, that doesn't fucking work. You know? Yeah. You always got to I mean, if that was the case, like people wouldn't smoke. Right. Which is like, yeah. how, how many places around the world now have like just these horrible pictures of like maimed lungs, and, like, <laughs> like, 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 uh, people with missing jaws and, yep. you know, whatever else, like on the cigarette packs and people will just walk into a store, see that and be like, I'll take one of those, you know, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I'll pay, I'll pay triple too in taxes, you know. Yeah, the problem isn't knowing the outcome, you know, in that right. case, right? It's, it's, it's always systemic. There's just There's a lot, a of, lot stuff. of other stuff going on, yeah. right? Yeah. It's very hard to convince people to do anything. And so, but you know, and, and like Sam was saying, we got great, tons of great advice that we ignored. We got mm-hmm. tons of bad advice that we took. But probably we didn't actually take the advice. We were just going to do it anyway. And we got up, confirmation from somebody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If, it, if, it, if it lined up with what how we thought the world worked, then that was the thing we were most likely to yeah. follow, right? And it's still, so, unfortunately, that's a human nature. Like, it is still the it's case. Still like, it's, yeah, yeah, sure. it's still yep. true. Yeah, sure. It's still true. I'm not saying yeah. I'm immune to that. Definitely. We just we just hope that we have better opinions now, and our experiences have shown us more accurate, you know, realities. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, I've heard people talk about like, oh, like if you could go back and do something differently, you know, what would it be? And it's always like, like no, nothing. I would do okay, everything well, different. If, if, well, if, if I could go is, back, knowing what I know now, I could just have a new it, learning trajectory. I would just yeah, do. You do everything differently. Do everything but differently. If, if you, but knew. if you, yeah, but if well, if you went back, if you went back without new knowledge. Then no, you would never do anything differently, right? Like you did the and you, you did couldn't because if you didn't, then you wouldn't have the knowledge. Well, I, think the problem is like, I think it's one of those things where it's more a question of do you like where you ended up as a result of that? Is how I think about that question because the reality is, you know, you can't you can't go back and change. I mean, frankly, anything and know that you would arrive here. Yeah, so yeah, you arrive somewhere else. Yeah. yeah, you just arrive somewhere else. So I'm like, I like I like where we've arrived. I'm yeah. good with it. So I would, yeah, I wouldn't change anything. Yeah, if we frankly, could stay in this until I die, that would be yeah, ideal. There's a yeah. lot more ways for this to not be good than there are for it to be good. You know what I mean? There's yeah. a, there are fewer paths at the end of that. So yeah. And the grass is always greener. You're like sometimes we'll be like, mm, should we like start like looking into 3D stuff? And then, you know, we take a, we take a peek into like the Unity mm. community and oh boy, those people are not happy. Nobody's <laughs> happy. <laughs> right? And it's like, oh yeah, I mean, like it would be different. Different. We'd have a different set of problems, yes. but it's not like we would just not have problems, yeah. you know. Uh, so, you know, it's, as long as you're content, then you're, mm. you're good to go, you know. Adam, what do you think? Is there anything? I, I, mean, I would basically just agree with that, which is, yeah, the, the, the biggest change has been, I think for me, has been it's, it's, it's getting out of the grind set, you know, yeah. of yep. being like, <laughs> of, of being proud of working uh, just stupid hours. That's true, you know? yeah. And That's like, like Probably it's fundamental to the whole thing. Yeah, and like have and like and and being like really all about heroics and celebrating heroics, right? Which now now we try to squash condemn. heroics <laughs> and, and we condemn them, right? Because heroics are not something to be celebrated. So heroics meaning like basically emergency management is what it actually is, right? Yeah. And uh, and w- part of like the grind set mentality, right? Is is basically it's just a pure celebration of heroics. Is like what it is, right? It's all about how much work can you put in, how much gain can you get, how much blah, 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 right? And and you're basically just creating a trail of chaos behind you, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And and inside of yourself. Uh, and so I think the biggest change, I know for me personally, has been like I'm just I've like left the grind set. It's like not there's not even a piece of me left that's like I gotta get back. I gotta just, I gotta like be doing t- more things and whatever. It's just like no, mm-hmm. like I love. I, I like I've moved into like a craftsperson mindset, right? Uh, where. What I actually like is I like doing the work well is the thing that I actually enjoy doing. At a at a reasonable pace. Well, that's part of doing it well, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It it's is. Like, yeah, yeah. Is, is the absence of urgency. It's the absence of disaster management. It's all that kind of stuff, right? And – and so I, so in the earlier days, it was, I was very focused on just the short term, like, how can I get the most out of every moment from a, but not from like a life perspective, but from a pr- productivity perspective. Right. And I haven't switched to being like, how do I get the most life out of every experiment? Like that, that isn't what the switch was. It was just, time is just what it is, you know? <laughs> so I'm just going to make sure that I'm having a good time. And for me, that means doing high quality work without it feeling like, it's there's a disaster looming, right? Yeah, you know, you know what this reminds me of. That's the lifestyle I want. You know, what this reminds me of is uh, is in in WoW. I've started learning, trying to learn how to be a damage dealer, and I was doing all kinds of number crunching, trying to figure out like, all right, what like what's what 
button do I hit at the right time and and why based on like how much damage they do or what buffs I have or like there's a bunch of math that you can do to try to figure out like what's the best way to deal them the most damage right and so I was like crushing all these numbers and then I I ended up ask talking to one of our best damage dealers I was like what do you do uh like how do you how do you analyze who do you think what's the right move and I was like I was like busting my ass trying to like figure all this stuff out he's like I'm gonna send you probably the most important graph that I've ever seen when it comes to this question. And so this graph that it's, it's a bell curve of like, of performance. We're like on the very far left, it's the, the poor performers on the very far right. It's the best performers. Mm-hmm. And on the very far left, it's like a, the meme picture of like the dude with like the concave head oh, and like drooling like and up. stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, and, it, and the person just sitting there going, I just push buttons. And like, that's the worst performer, right? And then there's a person in the middle who's like sweating and screaming about like all these tiny metrics and like obsessing about every tiny bit of performance and blah, blah, blah. And that's like your mid-tier performer. And then the person on the very far right is just going, I just push buttons. (laughs) (laughs) Because it's basically like they're doing something really well and doing something really poorly actually look kind of similar. It's just that when you're doing... That feels like a when knockout effect of the Dunning-Kruger curve. Yeah, you know? it seems like the Dunning-Kruger curve. It is, yeah, yeah. And like like when you're – it actually just takes a lot of experience and time to build up the intuition to recognize what it should look right. like. Because when, right, when, when you're doing something well. badly, you're also doing it intuitively. Right. It's just that <laughs> yes. your intuition yes. is Your intuition disconnected. sucks. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> yes. And when you're doing yeah. something really it, well – and I think actually, because yeah, we talk about fluency all the time, right? Like, yeah, this is about fluency. Because that's like, like – I, like I love – when I, when I open up a TypeScript file and start going, like, I'm having such a good fucking time, right? Because my, my level of fluency, like, doing you that particular kind of task yeah. is so high. I'm just fucking You're go. just pushing buttons. I'm just pushing <laughs> buttons, exactly. <laughs> I'm not, I, I actually, I literally don't think about, I don't think about optimization. Yep. I don't think about anything. I just go, right? Yeah. But yeah, if you were to, if you were to, like, look at me trying to deal with, like, TypeScript again four years ago. Every moment, about every tiny every detail moment trying to was out. a battle. Yeah, or, yeah. And you're doing such a worse job at that. Time oh my god! When I go look now, at but, yeah, when I go look at so much code, harder, you know, it's a fucking nightmare. Yeah. Which is also to say, like, I think there's this weird. Everybody has to pass through the stages, you know, and like it is a grind early because you're trying to you have to build you're up learning. the intuition you build to tools. recognize, and you have to be wrong constantly. Learning is hard. It's really hard. Yeah, yeah. it's hard. And so I I feel like this isn't to say hey. Like if you're starting out your journey, you shouldn't be on the grind. I think in some cases you kind of have to, in order to build up the, the the knowledge base. You could probably do it in a in a more sustainable way. <laughs> I think that's that's mainly what it's about. Yeah, it's, it's about the approach. Because I think I think about this the art too. Like the art didn't have to be so hard. Actually, it's just because yeah, the focus was on productivity rather yes. than on. Long term learning and it. skilling yes. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so as a result, of, because I was so focused on just output, it was harder to achieve the same. I would yeah. have. You got to be I focused can make on more input. Stuff. Yeah. I can make more stuff at, more, at a higher quality now, casually, than I could even a couple of years ago, you know? And yeah. it's like, it's it's almost sad, right? When you look back at it, because you're like, you were so sweaty. You didn't <laughs> have to be. <laughs> you know? and now you're just pushing buttons. And now you're just pushing, pushing buttons. buttons. Oh, well, you're, you're crushing it. I think the one thing that hasn't, <laughs> hasn't changed. Which I think is a good testament to the kind of the internal studio culture stuff, and it's just the the supportiveness between the, the three of us at a high level. But then how that's kind of shaken down into the whole rest of the crew too, where it's because it, it's all it, uh, it's all related to this same thing. Yeah. But it's you know whether someone's out sick for a bit or says comes to the team on a Friday because we have our town halls on Friday, and they say, hey, yeah, I just had like a really bad time trying to make this thing work. You know, trying to get this piece of work done, and you know the discussion is always. Just straight back into, well, what's your process like? Why did it suck so bad? Can we figure out how to make yeah. it suck What can less? we do about it? And it's like, you just have, now we have fucking, what, 11 years of that effect stacking up and it, it pays up. dividends. It pays a lot of dividends. Like everybody seems to be having a very It's expensive good time. in the short term to be having those conversations and taking that time, but it's an investment. Yeah. You know? Well, it, yeah. it's just expensive the whole time, but yeah, but, but the compounding value proposition is- yeah. The value uh, outstrips it. Just Real keeps, good. yeah, yeah. At the yeah. beginning, you can't it, see that it's gonna outstrip us. So yeah, but that's, <laughs> yes. that's the part. Right? But it also, like, it also takes time. It it takes a long time for people who come into the studio to kind of like really get a handle on that. You have to deal with that, that a little bit. Like, I had a, I had a hilarious uh, conversation with. Carl earlier this week, who's, he's had a pretty rough week in terms of just some like home stuff that he's 
getting, Sick getting through mm-hmm. just unavoidable things, you know? Um, and he was like, Oh man, like I gotta, I gotta step, I gotta call out. Like I, there's just, I just cannot deal with this stuff around me. And like, and then he said, he's like, but like, I will still have discord. So like you ping me if, if you, if you really need something. And I was like, listen, no, <laughs> I am 100% not going to do that. Like nothing that happens tonight is going to be so urgent that you have to drop everything that is extremely important that you're dealing with. Like if there's a problem, we'll figure it out tomorrow or the next day. Yes. Like, it's one of those things I, just, I have to keep reminding myself every time. Cause like when I have, when I'm like, Ooh, I need this person to know this or do this or whatever. Then like the quickest way to do that before I forget is just a ping in discord. Right. And I have to always remind myself also add an addendum that says, this is not urgent, right? This is not uh, urgent. Because <laughs> so, I'm not saying do this now. And in fact, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not saying do this now. I'm I don't getting want that out of my brain now. so I can be I'm done. Just, yeah, I'm just making sure this is your problem now. And mm-hmm. you deal with it however, kind of whatever, mostly, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's a, it's an atypical approach and it's hard to get used to. So, you know, it just takes time. And you're right that you do you do have to, the studio has to survive long enough to actually see the benefits. To see the payoff, you can't. Yeah. You really, you can't do this in a short-term focused structure. You just can't. It doesn't no. make any sense to you know. But again, it's like this. Like the way that we operated at the beginning, in my opinion, was the best way to operate at that time. It sucked. We w- mm-hmm. we wouldn't have been able to get here. But it was short. We, did what we it had, had to, to be short-term focused because that's what we. Didn't have. But also, yeah, we didn't we didn't know any of this stuff. You know, we didn't know anything. We didn't have the skills. We didn't have any of this kind of stuff that we needed. Bunch of dumb babies. And we needed we needed to, you have to you have to do things poorly to learn how to do things well. That's just that's just the fact, right? And when you're building, when you're running a studio, making and selling games, the just sheer variety of things that you have to do badly is oh, so many opportunities, so to, many learning opportunities. We're still doing stuff eat, badly to eat from oh, yeah, the eat fruit from the tree of idiocy. Yeah. It's yeah. just in full bloom. We are gorged. all year round. Yeah, and, and the <laughs> thing is, is we. <laughs> Yeah, because like I, I don't think that you know hustle culture is something to celebrate, especially because the fact that we kind of like it feels more and more like people just have to to survive. You have you know? to, yeah. And that's not something we should be celebrating. That's bad. That's bad that that's the system that we that we have to be living under, right? Um, but it is also the case that like to because you're because we're not taught this stuff, right? No. We're not we're not really taught how to actually like be happy and successful in the world, um, which means the only way to learn it is. By going through that phase and then surviving and coming out the other side and having learned all those lessons, unfortunately, the hard way. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think that's that's basically what that's that's what we got out of treating ourselves decade. poorly in the early years. You know, uh, we learned yeah, something. If we so. could have done it without doing that, that's what we should have done. But I'm not sure what that I don't know would have looked like or how that would have been possible. Yeah, yeah. that's a very good question. Very yeah. very thoughtful. Uh, and that's all the time we have. So we'd like to thank our producers, Fat Bard and Sampa DeCoster, for putting the podcast together. And thanks to our community moderators who keep our Discord running. To get more involved in the Butterscotch community, you can just go to podcast.bscotch.net, where we have links to the Discord, a way for you to donate, and links to the podcast archives. And as always, if you haven't yet, head on over to Steam, give Crashlands 2 a wish list. It helps boost the game's visibility and uh, will help the game succeed at launch. So we'd appreciate that a lot. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.